Okay, I think it's time. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. You made it. It is very cold outside today, but mm -hmm. probably this kind of uh, gave us a little uh, a surplus of energy. Uh, so it's a real uh, pleasure to be uh, here again and welcome uh, mm -hmm. Bishop Franklin. Uh, right. Two previous lectures have been, uh, the feedback I've received has been uh, enthusiastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have learned a lot about the history of our church, mm -hmm. the kind of more remote history of our church. <laughs> yes, uh, somewhat. Nobody, I think, was, is still alive. Bishop Hobart. And, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. And uh, Robert Adams Crumb. But uh, I suppose that some of the people in this room have known some of the characters, uh, the two characters we, uh, who are That's right. um, at the center of uh, our talk today. So John Andrews and uh, uh, Jerry Hancock. I mean, I can tell you that coming to this church, um, I've been here for a year, um, uh, means hearing about them all the time. Not you know, sure. Everyone <laughs> said, oh, John Andrews this and John Andrews that. Uh, so I, I've been really, really looking forward to this lecture. <laughs> Thank to, you. Um, to see uh, these two characters more through the lenses of the historian and just through the memories of the people who uh, have known them. Um, mm -hmm. in, um, and, but you knew them as well. I did. Personally. I did. So I knew them both. That's also the other factor. So, uh, please welcome uh, Bishop Franklin, and I think thank you can give him a round of applause. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's been a wonderful privilege uh, to give these lectures, to do the research, and to really come to love St. Thomas Church even more than I did in the past. I mean, it, rather, sometimes you do a historical project and you come to hate the thing you're writing about. It's just the opposite happened to me. And I think one of the most important and wonderful things is that we've been talking about Bishop Hobart. Well, he's not here, but you can go see him at uh, Wall Street at uh, Trinity Church. But the last time we talked about the architecture, I didn't show any slides because we're in the middle of the architecture. I mean, it's, and you can, after this, the lecture last time, let's go back and look at this great Reredos, the great tower, this masterpiece, I think, one of the great masterpieces of American architecture. And today, we're talking about music, and as you were coming in, we could hear the organ. So again, you can't ask for a better place to give a lecture where you hear examples of exactly what we're talking about. This is the second Sunday in Lent, and if Father Andrew were here, he would be encouraging you to do your Lenten disciplines, I think, whatever they may be, and many people have a custom of having a fish fry for dinner on Fridays in Lent, which is supposed to be a sign of humility. I don't particularly like fish fries, but I guess I should do it to be humble. So imagine how surprised I was to find a couple of restaurants around Manhattan that are serving sushi-grade tuna tartar, stuffed crab, and lobster tacos on their Friday menus during Lent. So maybe the New York Times food critic will evaluate this pretty terrible sounding food and see if you really want to go to it or not. But this feast of seafood in Lent reminds me of a story from the era we're exploring, 1972 to 1996, the years of the rectorship of Father John Andrew and the tenure of the organist and master of the choristers, Dr. Jerry Hancock. These years became a time of friendship and joy, I think I can say, in this parish. In a way, the parish returned to the spirit of St. Thomas during the gilded age of the rectorship of Dr. Ernest Stars, the rector who really is responsible for this building, under, under whose leadership a masterpiece was built. And those years, the 24 years immediately following the eight year rectorship of Frederick Morris, who was low church. Some of you may have known him. He was evangelical. And I think it was a rather pinched time in the history of St. Thomas. You may disagree. But I think John Andrew changed the whole atmosphere, I think, for the wonderful years of his time, a kind of golden age, which the parish had not really had since the time of Dr. Stiers. John Andrew told me that each August, 
from 1973 to the late 1990s, he and Jerry Hancock would spend a week on the shores of Cape Cod, ostensibly to plan the music and the liturgical program of the coming year. But actually, he said there was a good bit of eating, <laughs> and that the planning sessions were always surrounded by an ongoing feast of lobster, <laughs> crab, and shrimp. He said, also all washed down by just a touch of Smirnoff vodka, which he loved. <laughs> <laughs> and there, no doubt, they were doing this in the spirit of Bishop Hobart, who, who also loved the occasional vodka. So I thought, this is somewhat in continuity with I'm trying to stress this parish at its best as a place of joy. Joy in friendship, joy in the love of the Lord, joy in architecture, music, and preaching. So to sum up what I said in the earlier lectures, it was Hobart who was essentially recreated the Episcopal Church after the American Revolution. And he, he tried to recreate our church against the background of the rise of a dominant Protestant evangelicalism in the Baptists, the Methodists, and even in the Presbyterians. So he felt that the Episcopal Church would be the bulwark against this politically motivated evangelical movement, not unlike in our own time. And he believed that the Episcopal Church offered a democratic but Catholic form of Christianity for America. And last week we examined the contribution of the greatest church architect of the 20th century, Ralph Adams Cram, who created this masterpiece right behind this wall where we worship and enjoy our love of God. Cram adapted the vocabulary of the Gothic to the nation and to the city of New York defining the unique role of the church in this world, this corner, this part of the world, centered around capitalism, secular values, and technology, and the renewed challenges to democracy which were going on in First World War as this church was finished. And Thomas Cram proclaimed the identity and purpose of this place is also to be a place of the freedom of identity the freedom of association, the freedom of inspiration, and the freedom of beauty. So Hobart had four freedoms, Cram had four freedoms, and guess what? John Andrew had four freedoms that I'll talk about at the very end of this lecture. Both Hobart and Cram instinctively knew this, that the Episcopal Church had to differentiate itself from other denominations or it would surely die, and that was true then, and that's true now. If you seek signs of their success, look around you, and this building, and the life that exists here right now. And now today we meet these two men. Many of us in the room know them quite well, a priest and a musician who shared that belief in our own time. As surely as Hobart re-envisioned the faith and Cram re-envisioned the role and the appearance of this church. John Andrew and Jerry Hancock re-envisioned the role of preaching and music in the Episcopal Church. Remember, preaching was not always our strong suit. Somebody once said in the 19th century, if you went to Episcopal Church, it's got to be a boring sermon or you don't think you're in an Episcopal Church. You might be in a Methodist church, okay. But that, as you all know, is not the view of John Andrew. It was Father Andrew's mentor, the Archbishop Michael Ramsey, who gave him his mission, which is our topic today, that he must use the highest standards of music and the highest standards of liturgy to bring his parishioners with him, as he put it, to the gate of heaven. That why do we come to church? We come to church so that we can experience God, that we can connect to God somehow in the liturgy in the music and in the preaching. And that's the point. It's not to come to be entertained, certainly, but to connect to God. As you know, John Andrew was an Englishman who came to the United States in 1959 to become the curate at St. George's Church in Rumson, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore. Has anybody ever been to Rumson and know this place? So that's where he came. He was in the United States only three days on May 8, 1959, 
when his rector insisted he must see New York. So they came into the city and they stopped for coffee and lunch at Schreff's. How many in the room remember Schreff's? Okay. Oh, look, all right, this is a group that knows all of this. And then they walked three blocks north to St. Thomas. They went in the door. The first time John Andrew had been in this building, and Father Andrew said he felt called to this great church on the spot. But he didn't come for a little bit later. But at that moment, he did feel called. Uh, because he went back to England, and he served as the chaplain to Michael Ramsey, who was the 100th bishop, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And Ramsey, who was probably the greatest 20th century um, Archbishop of Canterbury. And I would say, I think, don't argue with me, he was the greatest Anglican theologian of the 20th century. So how lucky for John Andrew. He was formed by this great figure. Father Andrew always said he owed everything to Archbishop Ramsey. He was really his father. He said he was not only my father in faith, but really, uh, not really his father, you know what I mean. <laughs> Don't get me wrong here a little bit, but he was actually, he loved him. He formed him as a Christian, he said. Ramsey taught him everything about theology. He taught him priestcraft. He taught him how to preach. And he taught him leadership and diplomacy, which were key to his rectorship here, Father Andrew. And what was key to that, never go too fast. Don't make changes fast. Go at the pace at which your people will follow you. And I think all of you here know that, the way that he made changes, but he did it over time, carefully. In 1972, St. Thomas called Father Andrew as its rector. The previous summer, Dr. Jerry Hancock had been called from Cincinnati as the 20th organist and choir master at this church. And the two immediately formed a dynamic team. And so as Inger will tell you, I went down to the archives and read through all the correspondence between the two of them. And there they were in the late spring of, of 1970, writing back to one another saying, oh, I'm so glad you're coming. To Father Andrew from Hancock. And from Father Andrew, oh, I'm so glad you're there. I mean, we will be a great team. They were already saying that uh, before Father Andrew arrived. So they made a dynamic team. At that time, the principal Sunday service throughout the Episcopal Church, except in Anglo-Catholic parishes, was morning prayer. And that was the tradition of this parish, a Eucharist once a month uh, at the 11 o'clock service. From the first, through slowly and carefully planning, they asserted the priority of the Eucharistic worship of the church in this parish and of music as the principal means to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. What were John Andrew's thoughts about his new congregation when he arrived, the situation? He said, his goal was to recognize its Manhattan location as not merely a melting pot, but this corner of Fifth Avenue and 53rd Street as a crucible for the future of the Christian faith, which I think has been a theme of these lectures of each moment people saw St. Thomas, not as a place that looked back, but that as a place that looked forward, a laboratory for the faith based on its location. Of the congregation, he said, there's a lot of gossip at St. Thomas. <laughs> I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> and it irritates me, but there's virtually no small-mindedness and not much judgmentalism. And my guess that's also true. The tenor of the time, the early 1970s, was one of social chaos and division. These were the days of Watergate, a threat to democracy and the rule of law, the endless war in Vietnam, for which popular support was waning by 1972. Remember New York City's financial disasters during that <coughs> period? The blackout of 1975, who remembers that? Soaring crime, increased drug use, shrinking population. The city seemed doomed in the 70s. I can remember that. Irreversible decline beyond redemption. Suffering not just a financial crisis, but a spiritual crisis. People felt that. And that was the backdrop against which Father Andrew sought to preach and guide this church. Against this background, Father Andrew set his campaign to use music as a mighty instrument to convey the Episcopal Church's understanding of the gospel message and the importance of preaching in a Eucharistic setting. 
Dr. Jerry Hancock was John Andrews' great partner in all of this mission. Together they did this work. They commissioned new religious music and compositions from outstanding English and American composers. Hancock himself composed many new works for choirs, brass, organ, choristers, other church musicians, and they established a yearly post-Easter workshop and conference for American organists and choir masters who could come here to learn their mission. So if you want to talk about evangelism, it is a place of evangelism. It was trying to teach the Episcopal Church how to use liturgy and music at that period to advance the gospel in creative and beautiful ways. So Thomas, St. Thomas Choir began to issue at least one album of choral music a year by 1975. And their recordings spread throughout the world. And the three American broadcast networks, do you remember when we had only three? <laughs> Can everybody remember the names? ABC, CBS, and NBC, and the BBC would trade turns coming and broadcasting lessons and carols uh, from St. Thomas live in the 1970s. And Jerry Hancock's wife, Judith, herself a richly accomplished church musician, made St. Thomas a center for the study and performance of 20th century French organ music. So it was a kind of a French feel to a good bit of the music. Because France was a place with enormously wonderful liturgical mu uh, music in the, 19th, in, the, in the 20th century. Throughout this period, Judith Hancock played the organ, accompanied it to the liturgical and choral music of the service, as a climax of this extraordinary musical activity, the St. Thomas Choir School, in 1987, completed a 15-story school building on West 58th Street. And Father Andrew saw that this is absolutely crucial to the parish's ministry of music, that this new uh, school be built. Very few residential choir schools in the world had survived until then. Jerry Hancock believed the primary motivation for all of this was John Andrew. He said of John Andrew, the guiding light for music and worship at St. Thomas was John Andrew. He consistently advocated a musical program and the need for a residential choir school. <coughs> this was not an afternoon, afterthought. For Father Andrew said in the 1980s that the choir school exists as a lively part of the church's task of evangelizing and bringing the worship of God to people. It is a school founded in the service of the Lord's liturgy. That, these are wonderful ideas, I think. In other words, all of this was for the spread of the gospel. And all of this was accomplished not only in the midst of secular, social, and political division, but also in the midst of deep division within the Episcopal Church in the 1970s and 1980s. This year, we celebrate joyfully the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women to the Episcopal priesthood. It was in July 1974 that the Philadelphia 11 were irregularly ordained to the priesthood, 11 brave women and their supporters who defied what was thought to be church doctrine about this and the general convention to respond to their call. But in 1977, women's ordination was made valid by the general convention and the ordination of openly gay bishops was still to come. This was also the era of the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, what some people still refer to as the new Book of Common Prayer. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> this controversial text was revolutionary and I feel prophetic in many aspects. First of all, it assumed that the Holy Eucharist would now be the normal form of worship on Sunday morning for Episcopal churches, as it had become at St. Thomas under Father Andrew's leadership. So St. Thomas, when people say, oh, it's a backward-looking church, it was not a backward-looking church at all. It was making the case already for the regular Sunday Eucharist speech uh, at the 11 o'clock service. Baptism is revolutionary. I'm doing a baptism today for my little uh, grandson. And it, I'm just inspired again by the wonders of our liturgy for baptism. Before the 1979 prayer book, one great liturgist, William Palmer Ladd, the dean of Berkeley, said, we treat baptism like a little Sunday school feature. He was scornful of the practice so often then of a tiny gathering of people on Saturday, often just the immediate family, often at a home on Saturday afternoon, using a tiny bowl of holy water, not a real font, a quick splash 
and a prayer and then off to the champagne reception at the country club. <laughs> That's what it was thought. But the 1979 book changed all of that, repositioning baptism as the solemn initiation into the Church of Jesus Christ with the full participation of the congregation. Baptism happening in the midst of the Sunday service. These are extraordinary things that were going on in this same day. And Father Andrew was finding a way to involve the congregation in all of this. The laity could now be lectors, leaders of liturgical prayer, and they could also be Eucharistic ministers. This was also the era of the folk mass, especially in the Roman Catholic Church. Goodbye organ, goodbye piano, hello guitar. Remember that? <laughs> Music of the people, not of Palestrina and Pouant. And Father Andrew was definitely set against this. This, this would be a landmark place to reverse that tendency to the guitar mass. <laughs> All of this, again, against the social chaos in New York. A stickler for high standards Father Andrew watched the informalization of worship with skepticism. He felt it had already happened here before he arrived. This is what he said. Please don't repeat this to the choir. He said, I found this in the archives. Uh, he wrote to Jerry Hancock, my attention has been drawn to the untidy appearance of some of the gentlemen of the choir. <laughs> Could they please know that I expect them to be dressed just as carefully as the choir boys in my church? I admire their music. And I want others to do so, but not to be put off by their untidiness. He further commented, I hear complaints that the gentlemen of the choir are rushing around too much before the sung Eucharist, which we've now instituted at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Please ask them to be calmer. So again, trying to create this atmosphere for the, the, the worship. John Andrew had the perfect partner in Jerry Hancock, whose standards mirrored his own and his abilities as organist, choir master, composer, an improviser knew no equal in the United States. At Hancock's farewell in 2004, Father Andrew called him America's 21st century Amadeus Mozart. He told the congregation, I have detected show tunes hidden in the fabric of his improvisations <laughs> at the great feast. One Easter, I became aware of the song Easter Parade <laughs> at the offertory as the children came up to be given po pots of flowers by their parents on Easter morning. I think that happened more than just that one Easter time. A lot of other show tunes got into that music. He praised his longtime partner in liturgy, saying, like the battering Energizer Bunny, Jerry Hancock never gives up banging his drums for standards, for integrity, for that longing to glorify God who has made us and your life unique for all of us who love you, Jerry. You are our beloved organist and choir master through the evangelism of music. Mission again, all of this for that mission. And as we examine the role of music at Th St. Thomas, we might wonder about the musical preferences of the other two gr great leaders who shaped this place, Hobart and Cram. I have to tell you this. The Hobart family songbook for their hymn sings Around the Fire on Sunday night included two pious hymns which I've never heard of in my whole life. One is Jesus, who from thy father's throne to this low veil of tears come down, not so happy, and Jesus, how soon didst thou begin to bleed and suffer for our sins. So that was sort of the Hobart family idea of a good hymn sing. <laughs> Cram's favorite hymn, you need to know this, was hymn 269 in our prayer book now, in our hymn book now. Ye who claim the faith of Jesus, sing the wonders that were done often known as the fight song of the Anglo-Catholic churches. In our, uh, uh, <laughs> many of you in this room perhaps have sung them before. 269 it is a hymn from the Annunciation, so you'll sing it, I hope, here maybe on March 25th, and think about Cram. As a church organist myself, I much prefer the hymn tune for the same text in hymn 268 by David Hurd. But of course, Cram never heard of David Hurd because he wasn't born when Cram was. But still, there were these tastes of these, and they all kept looking forward, certainly, um, to what was laid down as a foundation by John Andrew and Jerry Hadcock. So under these two leaders, the Eucharist and a beautiful liturgy and music became the heart of St. Thomas. Together with the theology of Hobart and the architecture of Crown, they added grand liturgy, preaching, prayer, music, to bring us to the gate of heaven, to create a trinity-like whole that express what this church 
and the Episcopal Church could be in the modern era. The worship and music they designed had to fill this magnificent space across the wall, be bold enough and grand enough to occupy, to echo off its walls and resonate from the pulpit, all to create this one experience of connecting to God. It could not be meek or fearful in proclamation or presentation. It could not be intimidated by its surroundings of Fifth Avenue, but rather it should be here to speak to these surroundings in powerful ways. It could not shrink from addressing the fear and concern outside these doors, the lure of the secular world, the lure of mod modernity and technology. It too had to surpass them in its power and its beauty. So just as Hobart and Cram knew that the Episcopal Church could survive only again by being unique, so did Andrew and Hancock. That's the great continuity here. We must be friendly to other churches, but we must be loyal to our own identity. This afternoon at 5.15 today, I hope many of you will return to the Jerry Hancock Memorial Concert. And as you may know, his ashes are interred in the floor of the chancel where the directors stand to leave the music. And Father Andrew's ashes are interred right at the spot where we, he would have stood to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. So their remains are right here as well. In his preaching, Father Andrew proclaimed the theology that stained, sustained the musical programs. He sought always in this preaching, his constant thing was Episcopal identity. He defined the problem in this way. The great problem of our moment is this. People are strangers to spiritual commitment. The Episcopal Church has not tapped that source of energy which only commitment can bring with it. Commitment, not the mind wash approach of the fanatic, deaf to reason. He goes on, I am not referring to the religiously obsessed who refuse to change their minds and never change the subject. No, commitment. This is what Christianity ultimately is all about. And where there is commitment that is free, commitment, Commitment produces a force, a life force, with which it has the power and will and intellect and physical capacity to transform every one of us. Because the soul is intrigued in a wonderful service of music, he wrote. All the juices are flowing. All the blood is racing because the soul is enjoying a love experience. Isn't that a wonderful way to describe worship? Not obsessed, still less besotted, but released into love with all the marvelous characteristics that the love experience brings to the services of life. For him, church music is exactly where the love can be experienced. To the gathering of church musicians at one of his post-Easter conferences, he said this. This was his direct message to American church musicians. You worship a God whose reality has vouchsafed to you. His reality to you will reflect the music you make. Consider God to be a guy next door. Do you think of God as a guy next door? He told the organist. And the music will be folksy, slap happy. It will be palsy, extroverted. And nobody will notice it at all, because, if it is incorrect, because it will not really matter to you, the musician. If your apprehension of the reality of God is that of a cozy old boy who winks at you, your spontaneity, your casualness in the approach you make to him, a God who ignores your disobedience and your meanness as he snoozes in some celestial armchair, your music will reflect the presumptions you make upon him. Consider him to be a sentimental old creator whose attitude to his creation is that of bland indifference to the need of justice, truth, and holiness. Then your music will reflect it in its sentimentality, its devoidance of depth and yearning. I think these are wonderful words about evangelism, about the place of music, and he's really a powerful force in saying all of this. So what is the apprehension of the reality of God that John Andrew hoped that might be reflected in our sacred music? It is this, and again, it's the mission of St. Thomas. Our job at St. Thomas is to know the power of the resurrection. And he invokes St. Paul, all I care for is to know Christ to experience the power of his resurrection, if only I might finally arrive at the resurrection of the dead. And he goes on, and this is speaking to us, I think, this morning. It can happen in your life. 
God can make it happen in your life. In your life, because the risen Christ wants to come and share it with you. And if he does, and you allow him in, if you want him to live in you, he will. And you can shout, as St. Paul shouted, Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. So what, finally, what does the Episcopal Church stand for? I love this quote from one of his sermons. We Episcopalians are less interested in uniformity. All you have to do is to take one look to see the Episcopalians do not possess theological tidiness at all within our structure. The variations you can discern are alarmingly obvious. Just take God in New York City. Go into St. Bartholomew's. Go into St. Mary the Virgin. Compare and contrast how God is worshiped and what is preached in those two churches and at St. Thomas. Emphases differ. Details vary. Compared with some churches in the diocese, we at St. Thomas must appear as if we belong to another planet, if not to another age. Can anything good come out of St. Thomas? Can anything good come out of St. Bart's? We teach through precision in this church, in worship, through biblically-based sermons and careful exposition of the Word of God, through the best music of which we are capable, given the unique privileges we enjoy, the enjoyment of a choir school and a superb set of musicians. We are right in respecting the need for intellectual struggle to discover more about God, but we are meant to grow in the knowledge and God, love of God as well. And then he says, I am pleading with you for an attitude that respects new suggestions and new insights that may be jarring and may harbor trouble for us in the future. Yet we must embrace the new and not let the new frighten us as we hold fast to that which is good, as St. Paul says, of the face once delivered to the saints. These are wonderful words. I think these words live on today. Would that they could be the mission of more Episcopal churches at this very moment. So in closing, imagine my delight when I had in the first two lectures four marks of freedom, four marks of the future for the church that I discovered, again, thanks to the dear archives. In 1991, John Andrew published a message that said St. Thomas also stands for four things, to suggest, to remind, to invite, and to inspire. Number one, to suggest. St. Thomas suggests that there is another dimension to this world, the power of the love of God. Number two, to remind. St. Thomas stands here on this corner of Fifth Avenue and 53rd Street to remind us that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, and a people singled out with a vocation with a proclamation to make. Number three, to invite. We are here to invite, to evangelize, to attract, and to convince people to join us. And number four, to inspire. We are here to inspire, inspired by sacrifice and by generosity. That, my dear friends, I believe, is a proclamation of the Christian faith. And it's no accident when John Andrew preached his first sermon as rector at St. Thomas, on De December 10th, 1972, there were 400 people in the pews. When he preached his last sermon here on June the 9th, 1996, there were 1,000 people in the pews. So I think we could say thanks be to God for John Andrew and Jerry Hancock, and thanks be to you who have joined me in this look at these wonderful figures who have made St. Thomas the church it is today. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I got carried away about this, but I came into this thinking I would see all sorts of dark skeletons in the closet. And what I found was wonderful inspiration from all three of these figures and all. So, I guess it's over to you now, right? <laughs> you have to, so we have to, no, no, I mean, I don't mean over to you oh, for so questions. I mean over to you to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, because this was a kind of evangelistic message, I think, to, to, to continue this wonderful, wonderful tradition of the church. And I want to thank Luigi.
for inviting me to do this. I didn't know I'd have so much fun. So <laughs> thank you. It's yeah. been much fun for you. <laughs> so we have, we have some 10, ten uh, minutes for questions. So uh, please keep them very short. Yeah. So that we let, um, uh, but you've lived through all this, so some people may have a comment or a quick story I can to sort of tell us. Start with stories to your hands. All right, all right. So right, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. This was, this is from a senior warden who I think should Your be this. Is, one other thing he did, reluctantly I think, was we initiated an Every Member canvas. Okay. In the early seventies. Mm -hmm. We had never asked for money in this church mm -hmm. prior to that. I be. I guess I was not on the vestry yet, but I think I was treasurer. Mm -hmm. We looked at the funding and turned out one very nice little old lady funded 20% of the budget well, with her well. gift for the year. Okay. So we went on. He didn't like the idea. I told him, you know, got to get up in the pulpit <laughs> some Sunday and ask for money. John. <laughs> and I helped him write the. Are you the writer? Yeah, okay. Well, he, I was afraid he'd wobble away from the topic. Anyway, didn't want to ask money at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting idea. But you, you heard that excerpt where he said commitment, and maybe that was your influence. I think in the commitment he was talking about that the, that the parish has to be committed to the future of the church, and that's a financial feature. But he didn't dwell a lot on that, I don't think. I know, that was not his favorite. It's not his no, it's not his issue, but I think you must have convinced him. But I think that's what he means there. The other things, too commitment to Jesus Christ, commitment to justice, et cetera. Yes, please. I, I, this is just more of a comment, but um, I loved listening to your lecture today because whenever I tell people why I joined St. Thomas, it always starts with my first Sunday coming here to listen to the music and um, how that made me feel so inspired to come every Sunday so I could have that experience <laughs> over and over and over okay. again. And then the second thing that brought me into the church in a more deeper way was coming to these theology talks and. <laughs> you know, joining other parts of the church that have been organized to deepen our faith through an intellectual pursuit of, of God. And uh, to hear that that was the mission of the figures you've been speaking about, yeah. it's just really profound to me. So thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, th thank you. But I think that's, that's part of our heritage. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great emblem of it. This, this church is a great emblem of all this. Kind. So I, don't, I think it's wonderful that you're having this media uh, out you know, that you connect to the country. To that. I mean, I've been shocked that people have been watching these lectures, and I get <laughs> mail by email. By <laughs> usually good, but you know, not always. But I know, I mean, but that, that's a, that's a, that is a, that is an evangelistic mission that you're doing. I mean, I had no idea that you do this, that all of this is available, and that people are, are watching it. Bill Haas. Another uh, feature of John Andrews' uh, rectorship was uh, training <coughs> young priests coming yes, into Yes, that's very good. Who then had been uh, spread throughout the United States uh, as rectors, uh, all of whom had great ties to this parish. It was certainly one of his great missions to train young priests, turn them out, and you'll find it in rectorships and bishops all around this country. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment to make. But as you may know, uh, that we are going through something of a crisis of theological education in the Episcopal Church right now, the decline or disappearance of, of our seminaries. I mean, General Seminary down the street, founded by Hobart, is almost dead now. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a tragedy. So the great churches have to almost become like seminaries, I think, and to all that you can do for you, particularly younger clergy who've just been ordained, who need a great school to learn how to, I think Bishop Wolf could talk about what we're trying to do <coughs> in Long Island. She's the chair of the Mercer School out there, and we're trying to think this through, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely. Uh, but, I mean, we are like this diocese. We have the funds that we can do some of these things to, but I think this parish has the fun. So think of how this, some dioceses are beginning, and Mercer is sort of like that, to have a school f f as a seminary almost of training. Ours, we hope, as we reform it, will be connected to the cathedral, to spirituality programs. But if you thought of this church as some way of being connected, and I know that's part of your great interest, how can you help solve the problem we are facing right now? 
by f shaping and forming newly ordained clergy. And Prisca Pay was one of my students at Union, and she's here, and I think having a wonderful ministry. So thank you for asking and coming on that. Yes? One of the things that has concerned me is when I hear people speak about um, their um, congregation is dwindling, mm -hmm. that I know they're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really talking about, the need to not only have the theology classes, but everything. It's yeah. the music, yeah. everything. Yes because you have to get people here. Yes. You have to make your congregation and your word vital because it That's is. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, how many of you, you commented on coming and being changed. How many people in this room know people, or maybe it was you, who walked into St. Thomas and then your life changed because you had had this experience? So I think you're saying that, that we, we are facing decline, but they were facing decline in 1972. Absolutely. And that should inspire us at how they rebuilt and, and did this wonderful work then. And we need to think about that now. And as bishops, I think we think about this. We're getting ready to go to the House of Bishops, where this is certainly going to be on our agenda. We are facing not only this, the crisis of theological education, we're going to be electing a new presiding bishop. We unfortunately have a presiding bishop who is ill at the moment. We all pray for him. So we're not unlike being in the po point of time where it was 1972 when John Andrew came here. But you know, we're also people of faith. We believe in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I think these stories I told, this in it, it shows the Spirit at work on this corner. That is a blessed heritage of this church. I think that might be a place to end. <laughs> so again, thank you so much. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go back to work along with this work on Sunday mornings rather than having fun the way I have here. So, yes, so. Yeah. But okay. we, we um, um, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll have you again. Oh, I hope. For, for, for <laughs> many other, many other uh, things. I mean, it's been an enormous pleasure to no. have you uh, uh, both as uh, you know, as a friend yes. and as um, as a speaker for our conference, yeah. so we're really, really grateful. Um, and uh, and you tr truly inspired us because you know it's um, it's just uh, it was not just historical presentation, mm. but mm. it was also uh, truly helping us to see the spirit of our place yes. and what we have to what is our responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's the aim of these bicentennial historical lectures: is yeah. not just looking backwards, but yeah. understanding what is the treasure which has been entrusted to us yeah. and how we can, That's right. uh, what is our responsibility for this That's and for the future. That's so thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you all. Much, okay. And, uh, but it's not finished here because we <laughs> have uh, three more historical yeah. uh, lectures. So Inge uh, is here, she's going to talk um, about women in, uh, in, uh, in the history of St. Thomas. And you know, it has been quite male dominated on the side <laughs> of the clergy for a long time. But, but it's, it's incredible that, you know, um, there's been a lot of other ways in which women have been, have been an active, uh, a vibrant part of the community, yeah. you know, even um, um, in, not just in recent times. Um, and then, um, and then Fran, Fran uh, is not, uh, is not here good. today, but uh, Francis Bluin, who is the um, archivist, uh, is going to talk about um, Rector Styers, yes, and yes. Uh, who also is a fascinating yeah, figure, fascinating, a yes, incredible, yes, yes. incredible figure. And then we uh, will have Brant Montgomery, um, mm -hmm. uh, who is going to talk about the uh, involvement of St. Thomas uh, with uh, social yeah, rights, yeah. Uh, and especially with the, um, you know, the, the whole debate about the abolition of slavery, um, yeah, of the um, segregation. Yeah. Um, and he uh, he is um, is also enthusiastic, loves and fun. So it's quite yes. it's really lovely to have these people yes. well. gathering here, loving St. Thomas and inspiring. Yes. So, so thank well. you so much. Thank you to you for being yes. here today. Yes. And see you for the next uh, historian. Yes. Yes. Okay. God bless you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.